I want to thank everybody for taking out the time of their busy day in the busy summer to spend with the AirSpring team. And as Lanny mentioned today, we are going to be going over some very technical information. We're going to try to break it down, make it practical. And then we're once we understand that technology and where it fits, we're going to apply it so that at the end of the day, we can all make a little money. As we see here, our talk today is going to be the difference between Layer 2 and Layer 3 networks. Using the OSI model, you've all heard it, the different seven layers. We're basically going to talk about Layer 2 and Layer 3. Our agenda today takes us through some very generic technical specifications of Layer 2 and 3 Ethernet uh, frames and technology. We're going to look at the definitions. Always got to define the terms we use, whether they be nerdy or not. Then we're going to look at the characteristics that these networks use a lot. What, they're, what to stay away from, what they can do, what they can't do. And then we're going to go ahead and apply them. Uh, we'll learn a new product from AirSpring today called the EPN family. We'll look at their applications, the features that it has. We'll get down to where we even look at managed and unmanaged networks. What's the difference? Where do they fit? What we'll actually find out is that we have another arrow in the AirSpring quiver of connectivity to try to fit that modern day customer that seems to be changing their mind every two weeks. A little bit different format, and then of course we're going to see how Layer 2 and Layer 3 work together in certain applications, and then we'll have a big QA at the end. But a little different format is that we're going to break the questions answer up after we talk about the technologies and the applications so it's more fresh in everybody's mind. All right, OSI Layer, Layer 2, Layer 3 definitions. What are we talking about here? Um, from the IEEE homepage, folks, right off from where the nerds all hang out. Layer 2 is what they call the data link layer. It's where framing, it's also known as a framing layer, it's where I take a stream of ones and zero, put them in a frame so that I can send them between two nodes. Those nodes don't have to be on the same network, they just have to be two nodes. And those nodes could be physical or logical in these days. But it is the data framing. It doesn't care what protocols are inside. It's just putting a framing and error correction around that data and shipping it over to the other node. Um, don't laugh too hard on this next one, but popular layer two protocols, peer-to-peer -peer protocol, point-to-point, peer-to-peer, PPP, media access control, MAC addressing, link layer control, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, Cisco discovery protocols. These are all layer two protocols. I also threw an old one in there for us back in the 80s and 90s called Apple Talk. For those under 30, this isn't a new iPhone 8 or anything. This is an old protocol they used to use between Macintoshes before Ethernet uh, became popular. Layer 2 networks, as we'll see, run very private. They do certain things, they do it very well. But privacy is one of their main concerns, as we'll see. Layer 3, which obviously runs on top, as we say, of Layer 2, in other words, I can't have a Layer 3 network unless I have Layer 2 running, framing that data, actually then forms a packet or a datagram. What do we mean by this? Okay, we framed the data, we got error correction, now we're going to packetize it, put certain addressing on it for different applications. So now, network layer, packet layer, there's a wonderful functional and procedural meanings of transferring variable length data sequences called datagram from one node to another connected in the same network. Layer 2 networks, node to node. Don't care what you're doing, connect in two locations maybe. Layer 3 is looking for a network to provide routing and addressing to get there. Your internet at home is a Layer 3 network. Your Wi-Fi at home is a Layer 3 network running on IPv4, soon to be IPv6. If any of you looked at your latest cell phones, you'll notice you have an IPv6 address, longer, more of them. Those IPsec tunnels that we sell to back up MPLS loops, it's a layer three network option. ICMP, what's that, Chuck? Well, that's a fancy word for ping. You know, when you ping an address to make sure you can connect to it, that's what the layer three people use to make sure everybody in the network's up and running and can see each other. Address resolution protocol, actually, ARP, actually gives you the address so you can go play at layer three, generic tunnels. And another oldie but goodie, IPX, SPX, uh, that's for those who sold Novell back in the 90s, that's a layer three network protocol. So as you can see, a lot of acronyms, it keeps us nerds hired in engineering like that, but the main difference between two and three is layer two is node to node, layer three is network to network type traffic.
we have to keep that in mind. Let's look at some network characteristics of both of these. Layer 2 network, if you're at your office sitting at your PC watching this presentation, which I hope you are, you're running on a Layer 2 network with Layer 3 on top of it because you're going out to the Internet to see this. But your MAC address on your PC told everybody on your local LAN, here's where I'm at. That media access control address is the only unique address in the entire network. Uh, these are six, one, two, three, four, five, six byte addresses that use numbers and letters. They are unique. If any of you ever turn your Wi-Fi off at home and say, give me your MAC address so I can put it in because then I'll allow you in my network, you are doing layer two networking. Um, very popular in the late 80s, early 90s with spanning tree protocol. That's all you needed to do to run an Ethernet network. Very simple. But we got a little more sophisticated. We brought out the first virtual part of networking in the late 80s called VLANs. Those are virtual local area networks. VLANs are usually based to separate traffic either by users or by application. In the early days of VLANs, we put all the finance people in one VLAN, all the sales people in another VLAN, all the network people in another VLAN. That way they couldn't see each other's data because they were on separate virtual networks sharing the same physical medium. Now it's more or less application-based. Those who are using Oracle are in one VLAN. Those who are using email may be different. That way it provides some protection, but it's basically to separate the traffic so that you can control the traffic. They use Ethernet switches and low latency. The good thing about Layer 2, low latency. I'll go over some examples of that later, but it's all usually Ethernet switches. Like here at AirSpring, we have two 4948 switches that covers both sides of the building, interconnected with a fiber connection running at a gig. Everybody sees everybody very quickly. And it's usually application-minded these days with Layer 2. Hey, I want to run some streaming video of a multicast between my district's offices, as well as provide backup for Internet access. They have applications in mind because they tried running them at Layer 3 and it didn't work. So you see a lot of that today as well, specific applications. A lot of people coming for you for Layer 2 networks. And we'll see other acronyms like VPLS brought in that describes that type of Layer 2 network. They have a specific application they want to run in bandwidth in mind. And believe it or not, I know this next one's a bit shocking. They don't, maybe they don't want or need Internet access. Yes, there are still applications out there that run back client to server, usually private on a bank, your bank ATMs, this type. Um, typical Layer 2 wouldn't have Internet access on it, might be backing it up above. Layer 3, everybody has their own IP address. That's what makes it a Layer 3 Internet Protocol IP address, 192.168.20.3, whatever. They use routers and switches to form an entire network. So switches hang locally where all the information's at. Routers take them cross states, cross country sometimes, depending on the location and what connectivity is available. Internet access is available to all on Layer 3 networks because that's where the Internet works at. It works at Layer 3, and you need firewall protection to secure that for all the network users. And then, of course, Layer 3 people, since they have usually multiple loops going between locations, they want to address their failover needs as well as their redundant loops needs to their data centers. Layer 2 people, specific, precise, layer 3, wide area is what most people think, and that's how they use it today. Now, that being said, from a technical point of view, is very generic, very IEEE training for layer 2, data link, frame layer, layer 3, network layer. Today, though, what we actually, we actually seem very excited about is AirSpring's Ethernet private networking, virtual private LAN services. VPLS. Have any of your customers come to you and say, hey, I'd like to get some VPLS between these sites. Is it available? We're going to see what they're asking for. What they're asking for is true Metro Ethernet at Layer 2. I'm going to give you an Ethernet connection at each one of your sites. You connect to that, your network's connected. You have one big LAN. We call this Metro Ethernet because it covers the entire Metro Ethernet. Well, now you're going to see the actually entire and cover entire 21 state footprint to begin with. AirSpring is going to be adding more Layer 2 carriers as we do this, and we'll take a look at those 21 states. But the thing is, this is a true Layer 2 Ethernet LAN running between multiple locations at various speeds in their offerings. We'll see three different network designs 
EPL, EVPL, and VPLS that we can offer with this service. It comes with very low end network delay. Uh, some are quoting 40 milliseconds round trip from Florida to Los Angeles. That's incredible. Most of our MPLS, even at 10 meg and that, will probably run around 55 to 65. Now, I know I'm splitting hairs, but as a nerd, I get excited. When we get lower latency, means we can do more things. We don't have to worry about voice hops as much because the whole network's tidying, running tighter, leaner, and meaner, as we would say. We do make virtual connections between the physical points of where that Ethernet access is at, and they call those Ethernet virtual connections, EVC. So I might have four locations all running an e VPLS EPN network. Two of the locations might have four or five EVCs running between them because they're running different applications that, via VLANs that they want to run at different bandwidth speeds. So as we're going to see here, with this network offering a VPN, getting a lot more sophisticated. We're moving up to a little bit more technical, a little bit more questions about how you're using your applications, how much bandwidth are they going to need, and allowing the network to uh, be configured to make sure they get that low latency. And of course, very popular layer two is multicast. Multicast is a connectionless protocol that goes through everything. This is why carriers don't like it, because it goes through firewalls. I multicast, get out of my way, because it's providing the end user access to possibly video streaming, RSS streams, different types of media streams. Now you see it mostly for video streaming, whether that be educational, government training, we'll see some applications for that. But let's go ahead and take a look at the 21 states that we do today. You can quote it. We can install it, put it in today at these 21 states. It is our first partner for this type of service is AT&T. AT&T will have to be the ILEC. And in these states here, you can go under Quote Spring today, go under EPN, quote out the different rates. They run from, as we'll see, 5 meg all the way up to 10 gig. But these are the 21 states that it's available today. We'll be adding more as we have future trainings. We'll be updating you on those, but our goal is to fill in all the white blocks, obviously. Applications, you'll have your normal application, but the ones I pulled out here and the vertical markets is kind of fit together. I see, thank you out there for giving me these RFPs. Uh, we get from government bids, uh, private bids and that, asking for these different services. Server to server high volume transfer from our corporate to the colo, Chuck, I'm pumping data. I need a gig pipe just to back up all my servers now, or my VM servers, that type of stuff. Streaming video. Who doesn't stream video to their phone, let alone between offices for interaction, for meetings, as well as for training? Retail kiosk. This, as we'll see in one application, Hub and Spoke, this EPN Layer 2 is perfect for retail kiosks. Why? Machine-to-machine -machine traffic. Learning and education, have a, have a college in an area that wants to put high-speed loops in, provide video training to remote campuses, this type of uh, telemedicine, image transfer, and a little air spring touch here at the end. Hey, I've got an existing MPLS network, but I want to back up between two nodes, not back to the hub. I can get a layer two connection between those nodes, provide local backup. So as you know, everything here, Chuck always uses every new feature multiple ways. So now we even see this layer two backing up layer three. We can do that. Where does it fit in at? Finance services and governments love private networks. They love that there's no internet on it. I don't have to worry about firewalling. All I have to do is hook my ethernet and run it. Those would be the two biggest I see with healthcare and education following close behind, as well as systems integrators who are like yourselves out there that we have many in our, our agencies, that you're selling entire solution. You're not just selling a loop. You're selling the software. You're selling it from layer one to layer seven, and the layer two with the layer freeze providing that networking you need at, at those layers. So as you can see, a lot of market here for us to go and attack. Now, that was layer two and its market, but a little rehash. What is MPLS again, Chuck, layer three? And I just want to bring this back, refresher. We did this a couple months back, but it was more to show you the frame that we have here, right down here in the framing, where remember I talked layer two is Mac, IP is layer three, MPLS kind of sits in both, but at AirSpring we run primarily a layer three MPLS network with IP addressing and destination routing. 
Uh, most people do it that way. It's easier to troubleshoot and maintain. But once again, uh, it is a shim that fits in between there, so we don't have to go into the IP packet to see where the destination is. I can just look at the multiple MPLS labels, route on that. But this is a good showing of where the MAC address fits in correlation with the layer at layer two versus layer three IP and MPLS in between from a nerd point of view. So we must keep on because as I say, every layer three network runs on a layer two network underneath it. Layer three, more of a wide area approach because it's looking for redundancy for loops in the carrier network. Supports T1 up to gig E. Loop redundancy with our mesh, you can have an AT&T network backed up by CenturyLink, now even backed up by Layer 2 AT&T on top of that, as we'll see. It is a private Layer 3 network. Get all your, you know, your managed services, building that pizza, building that sandwich we did in the past seminars where put in the Layer 3, put on the voice services, do all that. And of course, it's available in some foreign countries and all the continuous 48 states here. Hawaii and Alaska every now and then, but they're usually quite expensive. So we kind of knew this was a little refresher course on the layer two versus layer three in those respects, as well as the areas we'll see here, the MPLS mesh in a later application will actually play with the EPN to provide services. So a quick pause uh, for questions. Uh, go ahead and if you have any questions, hit star six. And we'll field them now on what we've talked about so, so far. I've got a question for you. With this service, can you also um, pull into it other services like um, like SIP trunking and Internet port um, and, and distribute that th those applications across the the layer two uh, infrastructure? Great question. And once again, since everybody can hear it, the question was: How do I bring all those service goodies like maybe hosted voice? SIP trunking, internet access to these layer two sites, uh, being that it's all a private layer two network, you know. And the answer is yes. What we'll have to, as we'll see here in a little bit, what we'll have to do is pull in an MPLS or maybe a managed connectivity loop to one of the nodes in that private network. Then all the other nodes will have access to it. So uh, great question, and we'll see how we'll be able to fit that in. I actually call that pulling in like a service loop that, hey, we've got a four node layer two network at the main node. We also have an MPLS or managed connectivity with SIP trunking or AirPBX on it. That way we can get the benefits of the layer two while also getting the services of the layer three. But yeah, that's, to me, that's the ultimate goal. Good question. And that's going to be case by case to make sure that we get it all right for the customer. So a little bit more engineering. Chuck will be a lot more busier, but that's fine. All righty. Let's keep her going. We'll have another question stop here. Don't worry. Now, let's look at our building blocks for this private layer two. The family name is EPN, Ethernet Private Network. We offer three design offerings. We offer a point-to-point, -point, we call it EPL, Ethernet Private Line. We offer a hub and spoke, Ethernet Virtual Private Line. That one's kind of funky. And then we offer true VPLS, which is, I think, one of the rages. Miles, our marketing guys, Chuck, everybody's VPLS, and got which is true any-to-any -any mesh like layer two connectivity. The first one is pretty interesting. Virtually uh, Ethernet private line from location one to location two. It is virtually a private wire service between two dedicated, between, I'm sorry, dedicated facilities between two locations. That was easy to read, Chuck. Anyway, what I mean by this is I have two locations. I'm going to give you an Ethernet jack at one, an Ethernet jack at the other. They're both going to run the same Ethernet speed and say, have fun, enjoy it. You want to run multiple VLANs? Go ahead. You want to run multicast? Go ahead. This is a private layer two circuit between these two locations. I call it the bank and financial institution stream. They can do whatever they want at the port based. As we see here, these are port based, meaning that if this is five meg here, it's five meg over there. If that's a gig E there at 100 meg, it's a gig E 100 meg over there. They're symmetric to each other. What goes in goes out. Customers doing their own thing, off they go. So a lot of banks and financial institutions have asked us for this type of service. So now we can offer it and uh, move forward. Uh, customers can use their own networking equipment here, do their own thing, do their own thing if they like. So as you can see, we're now moving to the customer that, hey, yeah, I love all your services, but over here I do my own thing. I got my own IT department. 
um, you know, a little bit more sophistication, a little bit more nodes, maybe a little bit more money for us all as well. But think of this, and I'm going to show my age, Lanny. This is like the old private lease line, four-wire lease line, red, green, yellow, black jack on the wall. I hooked up my modem to, and they gave me 96K, and I ran all my stat muxes across. Doing the same thing here, except it's Ethernet in, Ethernet out now. So as you can see, very exciting. One of the interesting applications we're going to do with this, and this is one of Chuck's homemade drawings, obviously, is, well, Chuck, I have a bank that talks to two different institutions. They don't want to touch each other. Here we see a 5 meg going to Atlanta to LA. Here's a 10 meg going between Danos and LA. Even though they're sharing the same layer 2 network, they don't touch or see each other whatsoever. Even if they wanted to, we'd have to sell them a different product. These are two private lines point to point. A lot of banks, financial like that, keep everything separate. Um, and from a HIPAA compliance point of view, they don't even need a firewall or anything. This is already compliant. But it is two different physical connections at the hub location. It's a little different. We're used to having one connect connection to connect us to everywhere. Here they're doing it on purpose to keep the data separate, as well as, hey, if I have to troubleshoot the green, I'm not touching the red, those type of scenarios. So true good old-fashioned lease line point-to-point -point type of networks. That's private line. Whether that goes from Atlanta to LA or Atlanta to Virginia or Atlanta to Miami, doesn't matter. Same layer two characteristics. What goes in goes out, very symmetric. Oh, here we are, pros and cons. Predictable formats, very low latency. These are the probably 40 milliseconds in lace type of folks. Symmetric bandwidth, what do we mean there? Same speeds on both ends. Full fort rates, that's what we want, make it easier. We don't have to traffic shape, meaning I don't want to take one that's at 100 meg and traffic shape it down to 5 meg, 5 meg in, 5 meg out, keep it simple. And this is for the customer that asked for and wants to use their own network here. We get that quite a lot now. If you get more sophisticated, hey, just give me the wires between the two locations, get out of the way. The downside to this, it is straightforward and very simple when you go to network it, in other words, I check, I started with two point to points, and now I have five locations. I want to go hub and spoke or any to any. We will then migrate you to the VPLS plan. So keep it simple. It's a private line, point to point. For those of you that remember what lease lines are, this is just the Ethernet version of it. About a watch line land, he says. Very good. Now we have a little more sophistication. We now have virtual Ethernet virtual private line. Virtual private line, that's the virtual in here. It is a hub and spoke setup, meaning I have three remotes, spoke one, spoke two, spoke three, that all come back to the same hub. At the spokes, they're all port based. But at the hub, he has a VLAN connecting him to each remote. So instead of using an IP address to go to the remote, we use a VLAN number four-digit number in the frame there at Mac, right behind the Mac, that tell us where the destination of this data is going or what group it belongs to. Some people call it group routing. Layer 2 VLAN tags, green, red, and blue coming in. And this is true hub and spoke. If I want to go from spoke 1 to spoke 2, like the airlines, I have to fly to the main hub and fly back out again. So when you hear hub and spoke layer 2, airlines come to mind. I'm on Southwest, I'm going from LA to Chicago, I will fly through Phoenix. That's just how they do it most of the time. That's their hub. So if you're going to run, this is not a great thing to run voiceover, especially running SIP. You don't want to use double voice here, but this is great for kiosk. Kiosk at spoke one, two, and three. Machine talks to machine back there. Very rarely do kiosk talk to kiosk. They all talk back to the main same if they were doing video streaming out for training. They all talk back to one video server here. Very simple. Um, my boss, Darren Stanford, you must know, say hey, franchises work this way as well. Franchise retails, they all come back to some software service here. That can be done. They very rarely talk or see or do anything with each other. So if you have an application that they share hub resources, but don't do anything interactive to the remotes, the hub and spoke of the virtual private line is the way to go. It pros, the hub controls all data and voice flows to and from the network in and out. Remote to remote traffic goes through the hub. Maybe a bank wants to know what the remotes are doing with each other, that type of scenario. 
The cons, as we mentioned, all traffic must go through the hairpin of the hub. If it's voice, you don't want to use up, you know, two voice pass at the hub just for one voice call. That's given there. Alrighty. Once again, before we get into more difficult, more stuff, any questions out there on the private EPL or EVPL building blocks there? Star six to unmute yourself. Uh, what about in pricing? What does it make uh, the, the choice? Uh, uh, the pricing is almost the same because the cost of the access and the and the port is the same uh, roughly. It's just a technical differentiation, or um, you know, I, I I like to draw. I would like to say to you a, once again the question is, as far as pricing goes, if the access is fast Ethernet, whether it be layer two or layer three. Is the pricing the same, or is there a pricing advantage or disadvantages, or is this all uh, a technical uh, plus or minus? Uh, great question, by the way. I hate to say and use that old real estate term, location, 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 yeah. um, but it is in the sense that this is all Ethernet now on the EPN side, all fast Ethernet. In some places, I've seen it where it's lower than the MPLS coming in fast E. I've not seen any delivery time differences from our partner yet. They're both around the same in that respect. Um, but it is, from a technical point of view, obviously you get to run more protocols that you don't at layer three. That's a given. But I have seen it where the EPN has been a lot lower than the MPLS. And I've seen it the other way. So you'd have to price it out on a case per case basis. One thing as you're all seeing out there now, though, is the bonded T1 stuff is going through the roof. So fast Ethernet, whether it be layer two or layer three, is going to be the uh, more uh, better choice there. Um, I, I have seen it around the big cities. It seems uh, the MPLS might be a little bit lower. The further you get out in the country, the EPN becomes better. But it's regional based so far. I'd imagine as we get more and more players in here and under our wing, that pricing will change. From the technical side, it's the fact that I am allowed to run these layer two protocols across the network where I couldn't at layer three, but that's kind of a given. You would have to price them out. And you could do that on, on, on. It is flat rate. So whether you go from Miami to LA or LA to Burbank, it is the same cost I've seen. It all depends on the bandwidth that you're using more than the distance. So the EPN is bandwidth based, not distance based per se. So you might see that with the MPLS. But for, a kiosk, for a kiosk application, uh, the uh, layer two would be very much more responding than the layer two. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, and the thing about layer two is you just plug it and get out of the way because the kiosk would, you know, with, usually with those they run a lot of spanning tree, try to keep it flat. We call running layer two is keeping the network flat, so there is no IP, there is no overhead. The response time is what you're looking there for those kiosks and ATM machines. Uh, you, you'll see a big difference between that and MPLS per se, depending on the location now. But yeah, to me the kiosk, especially in that hub and spoke, that's where the two really peanut butter and jelly there showing my my white upbringing there, sorry. But yeah, they really go together, and that's because we want to get out of the way. And you know, and the thing is, too, you really can't hack that, per se. Even if you got into the kiosk and have an IP address, probably just a Mac running, you know, and getting its internet from the hub, that type of stuff. Same with the retail stores. A lot of retail stores don't run layer three if they don't have to, just to keep it simple and also keep the hackers away. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good fit. But back to the pricing. Uh, run it on quote spring. You got questions? Talk to the channel manager. But I've seen it. I've done a lot of pricing. It it really moves around um, as far as the MPLS goes and the distance there. Great. Thank you. Thank you very no, much. No, thank you for the question. On the Ethernet, um, what version of is there a version of the MEF standards that this is based on? Is it you know the the old version? Oh, that's a really. Oh my God, I'm embarrassed. That's an intelligent question. I should be. I be, I want to say. Ver, uh, I'd have to go check. I know there's a version 6 or something that I think this complies, but I can get that out to the team because it does okay. comply with the majority. I don't think it's 100%, but I think it's like 95% of a true MEF. And then I guess that leads into my, my second question. You had spoken a little bit about latency um, earlier. Mm -hmm. So is there any class of service designation with the, uh, with the service uh, that we should be aware of? Well, the interesting thing about the layer two is, one, the customer can create their own layer two QoS if they want. In other words, between the VLANs they're running between, say, locations, they can VLAN and put their own on that. The backbone itself, the only time it will bring in class of service is when it goes any to any, but if all the ports are the same speed, 
then there really is none. It's when we get into traffic shaping that, let's say, we have 10 or let's say 25 meg loops coming back into a 100 meg gig e loop um, that you see the, the QoS put on there. And it is standard QoS at layer 2, uses the toss and disserve bits. The interesting thing is like on the point-to-point -point stuff, the customer can pretty much do anything they want as far as all that. They create their own because they've been given that bandwidth on that land and they don't care what you do with it. Great. So if, if they assign a certain prioritization for voice, that will be honored through the network then? Oh, definitely. Yeah, because basically, if you really think about this, is, since you brought up the Metro Ethernet, um, here, here's 10 meg between these locations on my land I gave you, leave me alone. <laughs> and do whatever you want. But at that same time, we now deal with a little bit more sophistication. Our, our customer, you know, you know our, our managed customers might use the service differently, but now we're opening up the door to new customers that are a little more sophisticated. As we'll see here, they might have a CCNA or CCNP or a Juniper person, and they want to do their own thing. And it's nice that we can address those. But great questions. All right, let's look at the sophisticated version of this. And this is the one that really... You'll hear, I've even had two or three customers Lanny, even ask me, Chuck, what's the VPLS offering from Airspring? I'm like, uh-oh, customers are asking me this. Why am I not up on this, right? Or, but it's virtual private LAN service. I am now creating a virtual LAN in the cloud, letting your LANs connect to it, and it's all one big LAN. It's all one big, happy metro, Ethernet, wide area network. And now, whether they be port-based or VLAN-based, it, it doesn't matter. It's any any design. Um, as we'll see, and this here now becomes uh, can become complicated, but at the same time, it can become quite easy to. Um, as I mean by being complicated, here's one, and I got this from our AT&T partner, where we have three remotes that use two data centers in their network. Now, the customer had a lot more than three. We'd, I pared this down to keep it simple, but what they're doing here is that from each of the remotes, just as we do with MPLS any to any, here the customer's creating their own backbone over this private LAN that we gave them and giving two VLANs to each of the hubs. So that if one VLAN goes down, they automatically are up and running to the other hub. And at layer two, this convergence time is probably five, ten milliseconds, if that. In other words, going from one to the other because it's all layer two very fast. But the key thing here is the customer now can design their own layer two backbone between their physical ports, between their own data centers and hubs. Hey, I want a VLAN to back up this one. I want a VLAN between the remotes. You can do anything you want. As we see here, these customer control VLANs can be deployed by the customer at will and not to set any rules or limits. They are transparent to the carrier because we're just giving you, here's your LAN, go do things. You'll see I do have some caveats and practical limitations here, but from a network design point of view, if the customer wants to run multiple VLANs between locations, that's fine. It's entirely up to them. So you can see it's a little more sophisticated. At the same time, each of these remotes might be a single kiosk or franchise. They've got them dual home just as we do at MPLS. The only thing now is the customer is doing it for themselves. Pros and cons to this virtual private LAN service, VPLS. Hub and spoke or any, any customer can do pretty much anything they want with any VLAN they want. It's up to them. They might come to me for some design advice. That's what we're here for. We're going to look as your technical advisor, but it's wide open to them. With that wide openness, you know, we get wild, wild west. Everything's wide open. There's a lot, a lot of cons come up. You might have some drop packet or delay packets. Wait a second, Chuck. You said this layer two is fast and latency and framed and air controlled. Well, you got humans involved. I might have. 10, 10 gig ports going back to a 10 gig port and or maybe go another way. Maybe I have 11 gig ports going back to a 10 gig port or 11 fast 100 megs going back to a gig. I'm trying from a port basis, I'm over matching the hub port with the remotes and I'm going to traffic shape down. If you didn't traffic shape right, that port's only going to have to have that much data. So the traffic shaping has to be there to get dropped. And what they call fanning congestion is just what I talk where, hey, I owe more or less us things, say maybe we've got 25 kiosks all running 100 meg fast E, and we're bringing them back to a gig E 100 meg. Uh, you know, 10 meg fast E, bring them back. So we're, we're over, over booking the hub once again 
We want to make sure the traffic shaping on those VLANs doesn't, you know, matches the hub's port speed, not the total of all the remotes. So now, MPLS, we do this for you. Now, layer two, the customer can mix and match that, but a lot of that has them doing that. We'll see how we can manage this for them and help them out a little bit later. But once again, the nice thing about the VPLS, true layer two, in and out, customer can do what they want. That's the, that's the pitch. Now, everything's got good things and bad. The yin and the yang, you know me, I'm going to tell you because I'm going to make sure it works because I have to make it work at the end of the day. Good feature of this, this is customer prem to customer prem. This is a true good old-fashioned lease line architecture between customer sites. I'm not going to be able to drop one of these off at the colo unless the customer owns a rack at that colo. So once again, it's prem to prem, but that gives it a total private network. At each location, since I'm giving them an Ethernet jack, what do I get with what bandwidth? Well, if you're doing 100 meg fast E and below, you're going to get an electrical 8-pin jack on the wall. You plug into it. Uh, some of them are green jacks on them. They have a light. Some of them aren't. I think most of them are. Let you know you have continuity. All the carrier is going to do is do a tone test down those jack just like the old days. Hey, nope, we got continuity. You're good to go, right? But if we go up to gig, and 10 gig, yes, Chuck said it, 10 gig, that's 14,828,852 packets per second, I think, something like that. Ooh, Tim Allen, that's big pipe, big pipe, big pipe. We're going to give you a fiber handoff. These are going to be SC connectors. I don't know why, the older ones. LS or XS, SRSW, LRLW, the LRL, SRW is for 10 gig, SXLX for gig. No T1s. This is a Ethernet private network service. All Ethernet. That's why we have the low latency and the high speed. All Ethernet. No TDMs. No bondage. All loops, whether they be FASTE, 5 meg, as we'll see even down to 2 meg, are delivered as fiber. We will change them at the box at the MPO for the copper handoff. If it's a gig and 10 gig, it'll be fiber through. And even if they're Ethernet over copper, which we will offer this on, it'll be traffic shaped down to 2 and 10 meg from that from that uh, 20 meg Ethernet cop maximum there. So we can use Ethernet over copper, but no T1s. Now, important from a networking point of view, when you talk to me about this and I draw diagrams for you to help you sell the customer, this is actually the real limitation is that on a 100, 100 meg FASTE port, I can have eight EVCs on that port. So I can talk to eight other logical connections anywhere in the network. On a gig, I can do 64, 10 gig, 508. So that, to me, the Ethernet virtual connections is where the true limits and only limits of the EPM product are at. Also, does support multicast. Now, many of you have asked me, can we support or do we support multicast? MPLS answer is no. It always takes up too much bandwidth. It gets in the way. It knocks other thing out. I can't QS. Here I can support it. Streaming video is the main support. And when you run multicast traffic, We'll allow 2 meg of multicast traffic. It has nothing to do with the streaming video. Multicast is the protocol that goes out and tells you, join this URL, and then I'll bring you the stream. So that multicast protocol that lets you join the stream is 2 meg per EVC. And that's, that 2 meg will give you a ton of multicast overhead traffic. Once again, once you join the stream, that becomes RTP traffic. Normal layer 3 off it goes. There really is no limits on the point to point. As long as you buy the pipe, it's an old-fashioned lease line. What goes in, goes out. And we support most layer two protocols, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, virtual rapid training tree, Cisco discovery protocol, link layer discovery protocol, that LLDP is what a lot of IP phones use to discover. Some of the ones we don't support are LACP, link aggregation protocol, those type of things. Large frame support. If you've got to stream video, you're going to need big jumbo frames. Jumbo frames, 9,120. Bytes per frame, big frame. That's almost six times the size of the normal frame. From a MAC address limit, each EVC is limited up to 250 source addresses. Source address means an end user address. So that way, if a customer just wants to connect their Ethernet switch to another Ethernet switches, they'll be maxed out at 250 broadcast MAC addresses going across. If they're using a router or trunking on their switch, then they only use one MAC address. So as you can see, a lot of flexibility of, well, I have my own router. Okay, that's one MAC address for that whole location. No, Chuck, I have people on an SF 
300 switch, there's only five of them over there, fine. You could put up to 250, bring it over at layer two. So you can see a lot of mixing and matching here. A gentleman earlier had a great question of, great, I've got a, an EPN network doing some stuff, but how do I deliver our good old pizza toppings and our SIP trunking and our firewall internet service and host it? Well, what we have to do is we build that MPN network. Maybe it's a four-node network. And at the hub, we put in an MPLS managed connectivity or even a DIA. Yes, even a dumb DIA loop with our router on it. As long as I can put my box at that hub with one of my loops, I can control and run the network. I know that sounds weird, but that's just a commercial supplementation we have with our partner. So I call this kind of the access loop. <laughs> you put an access loop in at the hub. Same as we would do managed connectivity for SIP trunk today with Charlie LeMond's centralized voice. Put in the SIP trunks, the PBX is there, all the remote phones come to that hub, use it for dialing out. That's how we bring those remote phones, use it there. And let's say uh, we bring in a managed access for Air PBX. Now those remote phones at those layer two remotes can be our hosted phones. They come back to the hub, come back to us over that loop. Or if it's centralized internet with our firewall service, centralized internet, our router's there, our firewall's there bring them back, we can do that. So the nice thing about that with MPLS is that that stays private and it keeps, if we use this with MPLS mesh as well as an MPLS for the access loop in to provide other services, that keeps the private of the network. So that's a, a plus if we need to keep it totally private using it. Then of course, all the air NMS, air care, all those air portals we have to provide service and and uh, you know other features and network outages and so forth. A lot of this stuff you're going to hit hit you a day or two later. Get a hold of your channel manager. We can get on the call with Chuck and Darren and cover it. I do want to un understand managed between unmanaged service here because now you can offer both. Before we were pretty much offering managed service. Put a pizza thing in. Put your toppings in. Totally managed. Nothing wrong with that. But we ignored a part of the marketplace that says that's great, but I can do my own thing and I just want loops and get out of the way, we can now do that with the EPN. Unmanaged network, customer operates their own network in NMS. They create their own schemes. They're more sophisticated. They have an IT. Maybe they're a little bit larger company that has their own IT department. They got their own local nerd. He wants to do it this way. He wants to control, control, control. That's fine. They want to operate on their own network. They want to control where the access points come in and off. We can do that. We can now provide that. Managed network, you know, to make this layer two a managed network with all the AirSpring goodies. Once again, as long as we have one of the loops is MPLS, MCI, or DIA from AirSpring into that EPN hub or large node, then we can manage the entire network. And you get the RNMS, routers, and switches, all that. But whether it's managed or unmanaged, Lanny, it's still your throat to choke or the AirSpring throat to choke. Even if the customer is running their own thing, if they have a problem, they call our customer service. We go in through the wholesale side with our partner. We've been trained to troubleshoot that with them. Off we go. So as you can see now, this is another arrow in the quiver of network design so we can talk to the more sophisticated and give them the privateness they want and get out of their way if they want. But if they do want SIP trunking or centralized internet, we can offer that as well. And this is what it might look like. Here we have an EPLS network down here with different remotes coming into a hub. Here's AirSpring MPLS. Maybe these are inside the states. These are not. We bring them back to the customer hub. We connect the networks together. We bring in SIP trunking via the PST and the MPLS loop, as well as maybe we've got a, a DIA that's also backing up these loops, the MPLS loop here. Remember, everything has multiple usage in our network, so the DIA is providing network inter uh, firewall centralized internet for all the remotes, as well as backing up the MPLS loop. Now, if I wanted to, I can get an ATM private circuit between any one of these remote nodes, if it makes sense. So, hey, I got two remote nodes that are close to each other. I'll get an NPM circuit, go that route, back them up to MPLS. So you can use those point-to-point -point circuits any way you like as well. So it does give us quite a bit of a, a new offering, making us a lot more technical out there. For uh, those who are more technical, by all means, talk to your channel manager. Get me and Darren on the call or John Honda with you on the call to go over the specific applications. Don't be afraid of the multicast or these layer two or proprietary Ethernet protocols. We'll help you do that. 
And uh, if you do have questions, get a hold of your channel manager. They'll get a hold of me. We'll set up a call and uh, hopefully you enjoy this new offering. There'll be more to come with it as we sign up new and more Layer 2 partners. But thank you for inviting me, Landy, and hope to talk with you again.